Okay, hello everyone and welcome to another edition of What They Did and How They Did It from Seaways Cafe at Friday Thorpe. Now, I'm delighted to say that today we are joined by Mr. Paul Lowe's. Paul, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. <laughs> I love Great your background. You. Love your background, that's fantastic. <laughs> now then, it, <laughs> if I was to sit here and list what you've done and achieved in research, expeditions, professional diving, diving training, television and radio programs and books, I'd never end because the list is endless in what you've achieved. You, you, haven't, mentioned drinking, you haven't mentioned drinking tea, Mike. I'm a very, very good tea drinker. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> now, you're one of the most experienced expedition leaders, leaders and divers on the planet. I just want to get a bit of an insight as to where it all started. How, 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 where did this all begin? Oh. Nice one, Mike. Well, it's great to be here. I only wish I really was in this beautiful background. And I wish I was in your Seaways Cafe, which became our hub for everything to do with the wilds, as you, as you well know. But uh, in spite of that, in spite of not being there, you know, physically, it will be fun to talk about this stuff. And thanks for the opportunity. I mean, for me, it began as a kid. My early memories were being in the sea. I love being in the sea. I could, I could be in the sea for absolutely hours until I was well past blue and purple and come out with mum and dad scared witless because I've been in so long and out of sight and all that. But then when I reached about 11, and bearing in mind I grew up in Monford, Essex, which is a long way from the, from the natural wild places, but it's very close to the sort of urban yeah. wildness. I, um, I couldn't do anything, I couldn't do school, and I was struggling to understand. I just couldn't learn. I'd never really learned how to learn in a, in a classroom. I hated the books, um, and me and my Herbert mates, we were in this sort of, race to the bottom. We were happy when we were in hot water with the teachers. We were happy when we escaped from school. Um, and I can still sense that claustrophobia. I remember sitting there just bursting with physical energy and needing to get out and yet smelling. And I can smell it now while I talk to you, Mike, that, that overheated painted Victorian radiator next to me. And I just wanted to get out. Um, and at that time on television, there was, you know, the Jacques Cousteau programs were on, Hans and Lottie Huss were on, these beautiful black and white images that they were making. I mean, you know, Lottie Huss was sitting back on the reef with a, with a, a, a slate, you know, and, and, and Hans Huss was going around with these, taking these amazing black and white photos of sharks. And my ultimate hero was Mike Nelson. You know, he was there in that wonderful television, American television series called Sea Hunt. And, um, you know, fictional character, but he was having terrific adventures. And he was on my screen nearly every week. I remember sit, sitting on my knees watching Mike Nelson, uh, you know, rescuing pilots who crashed in the sea, rescuing blokes from flooded mines, proper testosterone-fueled diving adventures. And it, in my eyes, all the beautiful women in the world wanted Mike Nelson to teach them to dive. And I remember thinking, here I am, frustrated with everything, in lots of trouble, in a flat, um, and needing to get out. And so I sort of had that dream of being a diver, but no family members or mates or anything knew anything about diving. So I kept that dream. I kept that dream um, so powerful that um, I still remember my mum thought I'd drowned in the bath because I was in there with a mask and snorkel, just laying back, mask and snorkel in the bath for flipping ages dreaming of what it must be like to be a diver. And I kept that dream. It was something that kept me going, as un, unreachable as it ever seemed at the time. Um, being a diver, how could that ever be? Inevitably, at that time, you know, we were doing the 11 plus, and quite equally, inevitably, I failed the thing. Um, when I got to secondary school, you could take it again at 13, the 13 plus. I failed that, of course, and no one fails that thing. And I was in with another great crowd of Herberts, uh, always in trouble, not learning, teachers were the enemy. And when I was 14, a great man who I didn't, wouldn't have recognized him as a great man at the time, Mr. Gray, who was our science and geography teacher, took us to the Brecon Beacons. And when we got to the Brecon Beacons, I mean, well, in fact, as we left the school and got closer towards the Brecon Beacons in the minibus, he became less of a suit-wearing enemy teacher 
and became this cagoule wearing inspirational happy bloke and he got close to us we liked him we got to the brecon beacons and i was good at it i suddenly realized i found something i was really good at walking around in bad weather i was i was good i had an instinct of good routes up and good safe routes on the descent i was great in the water i could camp I, in those days at the youth hostel you had to do your chores and i really enjoyed sitting out there in the rain peeling potatoes into a bucket and I couldn't have said it at the time, but I was so happy and I was like, never been so alive is how I like to think of that. I was like, Whoa, I found something that I'm a success at. And in fact, I still remember Mr. Gray, the teacher, praising me for doing so well, but me being the useless 14 year old on a big battle, you know, I was too proud to, um, to thank him, but it meant a lot to me then that, that, that I was actually doing well. Um, and it really helped in a, in a very immature way that a lot of the kids that were cruising school had a terrible time in the Brecon Beacons. And I was really happy that they were floundering around while I was really happy. So I had a success, you know. Um, and so the dream of diving and then the reality of life in the outdoors that I really could do and I had an affinity towards it. Um, was, the, was the making of, of any sort of success I had. I got back to school and with that launch pad of having had a brilliant uh, period in the Brecon Beacons, I managed to pass something, which was a flipping miracle, and uh, um, I passed um, uh, metalwork, O-level. And, and just so you know, that, that remains my highest academic qualification to date, so I'm very proud of it. <laughs> oh dear. Well, my dad's a late turner, so he'll be proud. <laughs> that's it, yeah. So that's... That's, that's, that was the launch pad for me. That was it. Oh, fantastic. I mean, so you've seen a lot of the parts of the world that a lot, and I mean, well, only a few will have ever seen before. You know, I know it's maybe a hard one for you to answer, but what's the most memorable, you know, whether it's underwater, on land, what would you say is the most memorable moment for you? Well, for me, it's, it's getting to a new place and you can never take it for granted. You're dead right, Mike. I mean, I've worked, you know, in the, you know, in the Arctic, in the Antarctic, in the deep sea and lots of remote islands and places where no one has ever set foot before. Um, and there's something about that emotional excitement that comes from being the first one there. You know, when, when I'm at sea and on the National Geographic Pristine Seas Project, I lead those... And we're actually, I've got a team of, of our own scientists, our own media team, and we're there looking for the last pristine places in the ocean. And then we explore them and work out how to get them protected. Very successful project all around. So there's a lot of work going into it, but there's that human sense that we're the first people to dive there. So if we go out on the ship and then we find it and we are out on the on the on the zodiac and as we roll in off the boat with the diving gear on and then turn and realize i'm the first person ever to be there it's really something and it's it's a very emotional moment it's very moving it's powerful and i like to re remind everybody it's good to have that little bit of fear as well yeah. what are you rolling into i can't see what's in there it's best when you realize you've landed into an enormous pile of of sharks because you you go ah that's right you know I'm not the top predator. <laughs> in these waters at the top predator. It's a great sign of a healthy ocean ecosystem. Or if I'm in, in the Antarctic and I'm the first one on, the, on, a, on, a, on a peak of a particular mountain, or I'm the first one to navigate and find a way on this big glacier or ice cap system, it's a beautiful feeling. And it still has that moment of fear where you feel tiny. I mean, you feel absolutely tiny in this enormous relatively featureless space and other moments when the scientist you know picks up and and gives you the you know you're in a freezing cold place it's absolutely blowing a hoolie you've been out for months and gives you the first beautiful leaf fossil from the project and says there you go paul you can have that that's our first fossil you go wow okay 65 million years ago this really was a tropical forest and i'm standing here with that so i never take them for granted and they have a a powerful emotional moment or skiing across Greenland. I mean, you know, it's a long way. It takes a month. It's a long, mindless, physical grunt, unsupported. 
Um, and I'm good at that. I'm really good at long, mindless physical grunts. And there are days there where you think, wow, you know, hellishly exposed on this journey. So it's hard to find one. I suppose if I had to pick one, I would, I would probably pick my first journey to Antarctica. Because right. that was something about, you know, I mean, I'd worked in all the greater ranges. I'd worked in Alaska, Ecuador, uh, you know, North Cascades. I'd traveled a lot, you know, the Himalayas. Tons of diving all over the place. But when finally I got to Antarctica, that was really something for me. My first season was around on the American side at McMurdo Base. Um, I was the field leader for a big project in Mary Birdland of Mount Erebus. A long, long way. Uh, you know, I mean, you, you go in from the base on a Hercules and then you get twin otter support to take you further and you're, you're a long way from anywhere. Terrific, you know, volcanology project. But it was leaving Christchurch on that Hercules, flying to Antarctica, and then landing and going, well, I can still feel it. Yeah, wonderful, beautiful experience. Here's, here's Paul Rose, the boy from Romford, leading an expedition in Antarctica. <laughs> so I want to talk about your mindset. You said it took you a month to get through Greenland. Yeah. In harsh conditions, not knowing what was next, unsupported. You know, what goes through your mind? What is it that drives you, that motivates you to do such inspiring yet dangerous things? Well, I think they're great things. I've all, my, my engagement with the planet is best when it's physical. I'm not much of a theorist and, and I do enjoy the physical, practical approach to problems and, and opportunities. And so Greenland is a great one. You, you know, it is possible. I mean, Nansen did it. You know, he was the first to organize a, a, an expedition successfully leading across Greenland, you know, east to west, uh, which was the only way to do it. And um, so when I lead those expeditions, it's the sense of, we know theoretically this thing is possible, but it's going to be a huge challenge. Mm. And it helps if you love the challenge. It's not much good taking these things on and, and, and then discovering you don't like it. No, no, no. No, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I love that physical challenge. I love the rhythm of it, the fact that every day is exactly the same. Yeah. I love it that there are times when it feels as if it's not going to work, the sheer impossibility of it, because the Greenland ice cap is like that. You know, it's high on the top and lower on the sides. So when you start from the uh, east coast, you're, you're at the lowest point, and the sledges are as heavy as they're ever going to be, so 130 kilos. The snow is soft. And it's uphill. So no matter how fit you are, those first nine hour days are absolutely knackering. And you, you, know, you stop and say, oh. and then another one, you may even get less, you know, you might may, may work for nine. But you look at your daily average and go, blimey, we're doing about 10 kilometers a day. Well, it's 400 kilometers across there. And you've got a month, you're not going to make it. You know, it's, you know that mathematically it is impossible for time and also food and fuel and sheer energy. But then as you get fitter and the surfaces get colder and faster because you're going up into a colder region and your sledges get lighter and you start to descend on the other side, then your mileage get higher and you realize you're going to make it. It's that, it's that sheer simplicity of life that I enjoy, Mike. And, and the scenery in the ocean or the scenery in the polar regions is incredibly simple. You know, it's, it's, it's just two or three colors. Maybe it's, black and white and a shade of blue, or it's a couple of shades of blue and some white. And it's that simple scenery and big landscapes that excite me. And that's where I feel uh, most free. Absolutely. So I want to talk about your projects closer to home, closer to us where we are now. You did a BBC television series on a whole range of different ways you know, walking ways, Yorkshire Walls Way, Cleveland Way, Lake District, Spurn Point. You know, how did that start? Well, it started because um, a man called Paul Greenan, who's, a, who's our great, uh, he, he, is the, he, is, he is our BBC producer director based there in Leeds, contacted me about a project to um, speak about Frank Wilde. Frank Wilde is sort of Antarctica's unknown hero. He was the right hand man of all of these famous explorers. And never really gets a mention, um, but he, he's a genius guy. And so would I be interested in uh, working on that uh, television program? 
And I said, yeah, and I knew the Frank Wilde story. So Paul came over to Windermere uh, in the Lake District where I live and we met. And I thought, oh, I really like this guy. You know, he's got really practical laser focus on telling brilliant stories. And I generally just liked him. So yeah. I said, yes. And then he came up with these, uh, these walking ideas. So after we did that program, it was a big success. He came up with these um, walking ideas. You know, so the Pennine Way was the first one we did. Um, and I thought, wow. And then in 2016, I think we did the Wilds Way. And it was one of those great moments. You know, oh, well, 2016, I did the, did the Pennine Way. Then I did the Southwest Coastal Path. And in fact, while I was still filming the Southwest Coastal Path, I came up and started the Wilds Way project. So I was doing this crazy commuting between, between Cornwall and the East Riding. <laughs> <laughs> So that's how it all started. And what I like about Paul is got, you know, we want to tell fun, interesting stories, whether it's gliding or riding many farthings or whatever it might be. Yeah. But the thread that sticks it together is the journey. Um, so that's how it worked. It was, it was Paul's idea. I like him. And I said, yes. That's absolutely brilliant. That's great. Now, so what's keeping you busy at the moment then? Well, uh, in busy at the moment, like half the planet, I've become a professional Zoomer. And um, you can see I've even got a green screen behind me. That was a big investment. I was looking at some of these uh, Zoom conferences I was on, and I was determined to, to raise the standard a bit on my end, at least. So I bought this fabulous green screen. I'll show you what's behind it in a minute. Um, <laughs> but the idea, the idea was that uh, all of the expeditions I had planned for this year, we've put back another year. And normally I plan these expeditions because we're trying to create, help create large marine protected areas. So we have two main columns. We have the political opportunity. Is that country, does it have an appetite for protecting its waters? What can we do to help them and all that kind of analysis? And then we have the scientific analysis as to what regions we're gonna go to. So we had at a meeting in November, um, scoped out the next 10 years work, 40 expeditions. Well, now we've got another column and it's called post-COVID recovery. So what is gonna be our journey? Uh, how do we make our journeys where we don't either get sick or somehow start transmitting COVID? And what is the destination and partner's appetite post-COVID? Because you know everything's gonna be different. So we're planning it and so it's been quite the juggling act um, and we've got everything set up to start again um, in January next year, we go directly to the Maldives, um, early January. So between now and then, a lot of the uh, talks and conferences that I do, instead of that moment, you know that moment, I mean, you know, it's like Mike here, if I go up on stage or meeting a conference, it's a wonderful thing, I sort of leave the hotel all polished up best I can and get there, make sure that everything works on the, you know, audio visuals and meet the key people, then, feeling the atmosphere, I tend to disappear for 20 minutes if I can and get my, get my head onto what I'm supposed to speak about and then pop up on stage and off we go. I hope it goes all right. But yeah. now when I do them, you know, I'm here, I'm here. So it's really, it's really, it's really strange to do that. So I try and get myself geared up for it. I'm running the screen and I'm sharing my um, presentation and videos on the great screen sharing thing. So it feels good. Um, but I'm doing quite a lot of them, and I've learned actually this, we're all learning new ways of working, that doing the remote work can be incredibly satisfying because I can say yes to more things. Yeah. Sometimes someone would say, would you attend this for us and give a talk? Or would you come here and present your something? And I would say, can't make it because I'm here and then I can't get there in time or they both fall on the same day. But now I find myself doing things like, you know, it was, it was a delight to say, yeah, Mike, let, let's talk today. Whereas other circumstances to come round to Friday thought would have been a snag because I'm trying to do too many things. So I'm, yeah. I'm learning that, that virtually we can, we can do a lot. And um, we're even learning that some of the marine protected area targets that we were looking at, we perhaps don't even need to go there. We can just help that country create a protected area by not even going there. So these are, these are new ways of, of working. I've absolutely loved it. Um, I'm keeping fit. Uh, I'm cycling nearly every day, running most days, using the famous penny farthing, which 
I started, of course, on the world's way. Right, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like lots of people, I bought lots of gym gear. I'm surrounded by weights and the balcony's got lots of, I've got a pull-up bar over the, over the door there. And uh, yeah. Bar in the Yorkshire walls. <laughs> <laughs> I can just imagine you in the middle of the valley on your pull-up bar, because that's all we can see behind you. <laughs> That's absolutely brilliant. So let's see what's behind the screen screen then. Let's see what this I'm is. Over the <laughs> so, well, the first thing is, it's an enormous thing, this green screen. So there you go. Oh, wow. So behind the screen screen, I've got me penny farthing. Yeah, I saw, uh, wow, I saw that. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, so I did the penny farthing, you, you know, when I met Tony and, and Elsie Huntington down there at uh, North Newbold. So yep. I, bought, I quickly bought... Uh, a modern version of, of the Victorian bike, and and I bought that when I was filming actually. Yeah. And then I've got me other, I've got me an ordinary road road bike here. Oh, I've got nice. a bunch of weights on the floor, of course. Yeah. Uh, diving gear, naturally, uh, round here. Got me the guitar and panning. So and there's the there's me pull up bar. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's just a case of case of keeping busy, and uh, and the trick with I learned on expeditions is that when you're locked up because of bad weather or the ship's late or stuck in ice or something, the trick is to just be useful. Do something that is useful. It might be in Antarctica, just shoveling the snow, doing the best snow shoveling job ever, even though you know in two hours you're out there again doing it. Tidy up the tent, get everything organized. So something is genuinely useful, not just sort of pretend useful. So. I think that's a big trick, and people like me that have worked in remote, challenging places tend to be pretty good in the lockdown conditions. Um, you know, take it as a new challenge and, and stay fit and focused and uh, be useful and plod on. <laughs> Absolutely. Never get bored. No, not likely. <laughs> no, 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 no. See, it's clever, so I've got the green screen there, so I look when the green screen comes back. We're instantly back in the in the beautiful woods. Another great thing about the green screen is is um, in an instant you you can you can have a quick look and you know there we are camping at the end of the, the end of the world's way walk <laughs> and um, it's just a bit of fun to sort of have something there that isn't. I mean, what what makes me laugh is how many people do video conferences bookcases behind them, right? Why do they have bookcases behind them? <laughs> I've I know I've seen that a lot. You see it with politicians, doctors, all that a lot. And I guess it's to make them look educated. You know, they do a lot of research and, you know, things like that. I was just yeah, saying that last picture you had on with the tent. I, I'm guessing that was at Filey, was it? It was. It was just, it was the night before the end. Yeah. And um, it was great. We got up there and the, um, it was dark. We uh, put the tent, you know, put the tents up and... I woke up in the morning, brewing up a cup of tea in the tent, looked down, I was just surrounded by sheep. I wish I'd taken that picture because there was like loads of them there. So it was, a, it was a gorgeous end because it had been a very meaningful journey the world's way. A bit like my polar or ocean work, it's, it's pretty simple landscape and it's very quiet. And I've always liked that, that you know, simplistic landscape. There isn't an enormous, you know, 8,000 foot peak right in front of you or something or you know, blooming great caves everywhere. It's dead simple. And it was something about the simplicity that I liked. And it meant a lot to me, that walk. I found it a very moving, uh, personally powerful experience. And so we worked out that with the great man, Paul Green, and that why don't we just camp on it last night? And it was, it was a great, great thing. It was fun, you know, because it meant so much to me, having done all this walking, that... Um, it was a couple of years ago that Joel and I, uh, we came out there uh, and as you know, because we stopped, we stopped and found you and um, we had lots of tea and, and, and great food at your place. And we did this lovely um, tandem trip through the walls. And, and it's just something about the walls. So it was good to camp on the last night and especially good to come back. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, oh, th th that could be anywhere, but I'm guessing it's down towards Dixondale. It is. What we did, uh, I'm trying to remember, I think it was there that we, uh, isn't it somewhere on that road 
that I did uh, sort of painting with, well not painting, but taking the pictures with the iPad and, and seeing if it matched the, the paintings and stuff. It was great, you know. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, I could sit here and talk to you all day, Paul, but you've got things to do. And but when, when are you opening up again at Seaways? Because I want to come. Cafe, 1st of July. If you want to come and camp, we'll be there. 1st of June. Yeah, it's we'll funny because well, it became, Seaways became a base camp for us for all the BBC filming. And then it became, uh, it was the base camp for when I came up for the uh, uh, blind people. Uh, I guided, I learned about how they do the sort of guiding of people who are partially sighted or blind there. And then Joelle and I came back and came up and it became another opportunity for an informal base camp at the Seaways. So yeah, we're, we're pretty keen to get back. Absolutely. Well, I am more than keen to welcome you back. Yes, please. Well, thank you so much for your time today. And I wish you all the luck with everything that you've got going forward and everything you've had push, to push back to January 2021. Thanks a lot, Mike. Hey, say hello to all the, all, all the Seaways Cafe team, will you, for me? I will. I will make sure they all see this message. Deal. Uh, thank, thank you very much indeed for your time today, Paul. Much appreciated. Thank you, Mike. Keep up the great work. Thank you.